So welcome. Um, uh, this is the first two days of kind of three days of meetings. I don't know if you've managed to get your heads around the wonderful programs that you have in your, your Hessian bags. Um, in there you'll see that we have uh, two days of uh, workshops and we'll come in a moment to what we hope to achieve with that. Um, and then th that will be followed on Friday uh, by a public conference uh, for which we already have, I think, 350 people um, registered. Um, the next two days we'll be here, but on Friday we'll be at the Royal Geographic Society, which is just by the Albert Hall, for those of you who are not totally familiar where all these places are, so that'll be fun. Um, so don't come here on Friday. A um, Couple of other kind of complex logistics. Um, uh, last night there was a formal discussion about dress code. <laughs> and the conclusion was that you, you, you can express yourself today, so I, I'm expressing myself here at the front. Uh, then, but tomorrow, um, we have a reception with um, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales at Clarence House. So you, the expression may be more subdued and rather smarter uh, tomorrow. Also tomorrow, bring your ID document. Without your passport or other picture ID, you won't get into Clarence House. So don't forget to bring your ID documents uh, with you tomorrow for, uh, to, to, in, to enable us to get into Clarence House for the reception with Prince Charles. One other kind of important uh, background uh, issue, as you see, you're, we're being filmed. So if you um, don't want what you say to be on the public record, you're welcome to say that at the beginning of what you're saying and it will be removed from the, the record. Or if you, you know, you really get into it and afterwards you think, ooh, <laughs> Or better not have that, you know, floating out there on YouTube, uh, then do come and see us and, um, and we'll um, remove the, you know, the relevant um, sections because we want to be able to, to speak completely, you know, frankly and, 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 and freely these, these next couple of days. This is, a, you know, this is really a, a working uh, session, really is a, a, a working group. Um, so, trying to decide how to open, um, open today, um, you know, here we are in, you know, in Dean's Yard of Westminster Abbey, so, you know, sort of, uh, I'm feeling it, a reading coming on. Um, somebody said, are you going to read poetry when they saw me with a little book? But it's not poetry. This is um, uh, the Prince's um, on the Future of Food lecture uh, that he gave it in, in Georgetown, Washington um, in, in 2011. And um, although it's not the beginning of the story of this event, and you'll hear more from Patrick about that story. It was a very critical moment, and I thought perhaps if I read what he said at that occasion, it will help us really frame what we're trying to do um, here. So um, I'll be using words like I, but it's not, I don't mean we. I'm just reading what he said. So he starts like this. He says, the well-known commentator on food matters, Michael Pollan, pointed out recently that so far, the combined market for local and organic food, both in the United States and Europe, has only reached about two or three percent of total sales. And the reason, he says, is quite simple. It is the difficulty in making sustainable farming more profitable for producers and sustainable food more affordable for consumers. With so much growing concern about this, my International Sustainability Unit carried out a study into why sustainable food production systems struggle to make a profit and how it is that intensely produced food costs less. The answer to that last question may seem obvious, but my ISU study reveals a less apparent reason. It looked at five case studies and discovered two things. Firstly, that the system of farm subsidies is geared in such a way that it favors overwhelmingly those kinds of agricultural techniques that are responsible for the many problems I've just outlined. And secondly, that the cost of that damage is not factored into the price of food production. Consider, for example, what happens when pesticides get into the water supply. At the moment, the water has to be cleaned up at enormous cost to consumer water bills. The primary polluter is not charged. 
Or take the emissions from the manufacture and application of nitrogen fertilizer, which are potent greenhouse gases. They, too, are not costed at source into the equation. This has led to a situation where farmers are better off using intensive methods and where consumers who would prefer to buy sustainably produced food are unable to do so because of the price. There are many producers and consumers who want to do the right thing, but as things stand, doing the right thing is penalized. And so this raises an admittedly difficult question. Has the time arrived when a long, hard look is needed at the way public subsidies are generally geared? And should the recalibration of that gearing be considered so that it helps healthier approaches and techniques? Could there be benefits if public finance were redirected so that subsidies are linked specifically to farming practices that are more sustainable, less polluting, and of wide benefit to the public interest, rather than what many environmental experts have called the curiously perverse economic incentive system that too frequently directs food production. The point, surely, is to achieve a situation where the production of healthier food is rewarded and becomes more affordable and the Earth's capital is not so eroded. Nobody wants food prices to go up, but if it is the case that the present low price of intensely produced food in developed countries is act actually an illusion, only made possible by transferring the costs of cleaning up pollution or dealing with human health problems onto other agencies, then could correcting those anomalies result in a more beneficial arena where nobody is actually worse off in net terms. It would simply be a more honest form of accounting that may make it more desirable for producers to operate more sustainably, particularly if subsidies were redirected to benefit sustainable systems of production. It's a question worth considering, and I only ask it because my concern is simply that we seek to produce the healthiest food possible from the healthiest environment possible for the long term and to assure that it's affordable for ordinary consumers. So that, in a certain way, is the, the history, the charge, the raison d'etre of, um, of uh, these meetings to try to think together um, how uh, we could actually put into practice some of these uh, systems that would incentivate, will create a level playing field and thus incentivate doing the right thing. On that note, I'm going to turn over to Patrick to give us more of that history. Uh, thank you very much, Ken, and uh, good morning. Um, I want to start by thanking you all for coming. Um, many of you come a very long way, even as far as New Zealand. Um, many of you have uh, been on a roller coaster of communications with us over the last uh, few weeks and indeed months. And I'd just like to thank you all for bearing with us during the preparations for this event um, and for making an enormous effort, uh, both in terms of the travel but also the time you put in uh, to be with us here today and also for the next three days. So thank you very, very much. Um, I also want to thank uh, those who, without whose support we would not be here today. Um, particularly, I want to thank the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and Guillermo for really being so generous without your support um, and the support of Sam Dryden uh, for, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This meeting would not be taking place. So thank you so much, both, of, both foundations, for your core support. <laughs> is, Sa is Sam here yet? He may not be here, but he, he, he broke his finger, and I saw the x-ray last night, but he's going to be with us <laughs> later. But uh, uh, Sam and Guillermo, really, it's fantastic that you've been so supportive over the last couple of years and beyond that. Um, I want to thank also the VK Rasmussen Foundation, um, the Prince's Charities, um, the Tudor Trust, Matt's, I see Matt Dunwell there, and uh, a lot of people are able to attend these days due to the assisted places that the a grant from the Tudor Trust has made possible, so thank you very much. Uh, the McKnight Foundation, Jane is here somewhere, wherever she is, there she is, thank you Jane. Um, 
Owsley Brown Charitable Foundation and Christy Brown, uh, who have done so much. It's beyond measure what you've done uh, to help today happen. And we are being filmed, as Ken has said, but there's also a graphic illustrator on my right. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, through your generosity and Christie's generosity, uh, much of what's happening over the next three days, wouldn't, without your generosity, it wouldn't have been possible. So thank you so much. Uh, also, the Grace Communications Foundation, the Sainsbury's Charitable Trust, the Esme Fairburn Foundation, the Marmot Trust, Triodos Bank, Compassion in World Farming, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, the National Trust, all those organizations and foundations have been generous in supporting uh, making the arrangements for the next three days take place. So thank you all very much. I'd also like to thank the volunteers, great team of SFT volunteers and team SFT generally for being magnificent in uh, helping us make it all the arrangements work for today. So thank you all. Um, and you're going, to, you're going to meet all these people over the next three days who will uh, uh, see you through the maze of this building and generally help. So thank you. And now to the, uh, the theme of the meeting, which um, Ken has already touched on, and actually the Prince's words say it better than I possibly could, uh, namely that the economics of our present food systems are distorted in such a way that if you're a producer, the most profitable option is to farm in an intensive way, and if you're a consumer, the most affordable food is, is, is produced intensively, sending all the wrong signals in terms of business case and what you should do as a citizen um, because of the failure to cost in the consequences of our actions as producers into the equation, namely to factor in the emissions, the depletion of natural capital, the pollution, the impact on biodiversity, on animal welfare, the human health costs, and the wider social and cultural externalities into the true price of food. And because of that failure, it's systematized a system of food production which has had hugely negative consequences for several generations, arguably since the Second World War and even, be even before that. And we are here, hopefully, to do something about that um, over the next couple of days. And uh, as Ken has also said, there are about 100 of us for today and tomorrow, and then the number will expand to, I think it's over 350, and people are still booking uh, when we are at the Royal Geographic Society on Friday. And our idea was to do some work on this subject, looking at categorizing, pricing, quantifying and pricing the various externalities, positive and negative, arising from different food systems, discussing policy instruments by w through which we can create a more fair and honest pricing system for our food. And then we're kind of turning the mirror outwards so that the public can understand these issues. We need to make the, these issues accessible to ordinary people who are not experts and don't speak in jargon because otherwise the changes that are needed will never happen. So that's the process. And Ken wanted me to say something about the history. He's already mentioned the Georgetown Conference and read from the Prince's speech. In fact, the origins of this initiative go back a year before that uh, when Prince Charles hosted a meeting of around 25 people in leadership positions in the wider sustainable food movement from various different uh, uh, areas of, of activity, including the foundation's community, NGOs, policy makers, communicators. And everybody sat around the table and said, look, we, the food system we have, as Michael Pollan said, um, has a, is, 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 is going in the wrong direction. But as Michael Pollan said, we haven't been able to break through in the sustainable food movement into the mainstream because of this failure to be properly accountable for the pricing of food, and something needs to be done about it. And around the table, there was a discussion about what role the prince could play, and somebody said, I think it was Eric Schlosser, he said, you know, sir, if you gave a speech in America, it would make a difference. And he, the prince immediately said, I'll do that. And that was the reason why he came to Georgetown and gave the Georgetown speech uh, on the future of food. In the margins of that meeting, there were two side meetings, one of which brought together around 
25 people representing foundations, nearly all of which were North American, um, with an interest in supporting sustainable food. And there was a discussion about how this group, there's a fantastic atmosphere in this meeting, there was a discussion about how the group could be widened, and it was suggested that actually this should become an international community of foundations supporting sustainable agriculture. And once again, the prince said, well, if it would be useful, I'll host a meeting at Highgrove, which could bring some of those people together, which is how the meeting which took place in June 2012 came to be, which brought together around 30 foundations from all over the world, many of whom are represented in this room today, to discuss strategies for addressing some of the themes that the prince raised in his Georgetown speech. And one of the remarkable outcomes of that meeting was um, an agreement uh, to establish uh, a, a formal collaboration, an international collaboration uh, of foundations with an interest in this field and to appoint um, a full-time coordinator. And I shall come back to that in a moment. Um, then there was a vote about the priority areas for action. And I think we had nine areas which we all voted on as to which should receive the most important urgent attention. Um, one of the top ranking priorities was true cost accounting, or externalities, as e economists tend to call them. And it was Christy Brown uh, that said to me afterwards, you know, uh, don't you think we should take that initiative forward to maintain the momentum? Uh, if it would be useful, because, uh, um, because of the celebrations for the 35th anniversary of the publication of Wendell Berry's book, The Unsettling of America, which is taking place in Louisville last April, uh, why don't we use the, the fact that this gathering is take, taking place to have another meeting where we focus on true cost accounting? And that was the meeting which many of you were at in Kentucky, which brought together around 60 people, uh, representing, again, this incredible diverse range of interests, uh, where we commenced the process which we're, go we're going to continue over the next three days. And I hope... If it's ready, we've just, we've just got an impressionistic three-minute clip of some of the stuff which took place at that meeting. So let's, let's watch that. Why does true cost accounting matter? I'd like to tell you the story of a global industry that um, is highly subsidized in the sense that their costs of production are reduced by uh, government investments, public investments. It's a global industry. Those investments distort the decisions that both people in that industry and the people that interact with that industry make. So uh, the products of this industry are cheaper than they should be because of those subsidies and so therefore it incentivizes higher consumption than we would normally see and it incentivizes more production uh, than would normally be justified. Uh, and another story of uh, this industry is that it um, does not have to pay for environmental damages that it causes, which again are global and are major. And this industry is the global petroleum industry. And the cost of those distortions has been estimated at $2 trillion annually. I'm going to give you just the briefest taste of an area of environmental health sciences that has exploded over the last 20 years. Some profound discoveries that challenge what we thought we knew about how to tell when something was safe and when it wasn't. And this has huge implications for how we calculate the economic externalities of industrial agriculture. I think we all know that antibiotic resistance is increasing globally. There have been major concerns raised about it recently. The triple bottom line is looking at ecological uh, and social and, and financial issues. This is about people. It's about charismatic animals. What about the health impacts 
on human beings from bad food. The environment is so, so diverse, why would you ever think that one policy would work best over the whole place? How do you actually change the policymakers? Well, you have to get enough people who are involved um, or, or who they impact um, to um, uh, actually pay attention and create a conflict or a tension for them. It's not what you say that's important. It's what people hear that's important. And if you want people to hear something, you should understand the language that they are receptive to. You need to look at the complexity of, uh, of these problems. There's no point looking at, say, just a technology solution or just a soil solution. That sort of these are complex problems, and you have to accept that if you actually want to produce um, solutions which have real impact uh, in the world. What gets measured gets managed. And so if, that, if, if, you, if, the, if the requirement was just to provide this information, you're already going to start moving that needle in the right direction. I don't think that a cheap food policy actually is in existence. There is no such thing as cheap food. You push the costs onto future generations, or you push the costs into different parts of the planet. I think the secret um, to success in the work that we're doing is the rebuilding of relationships that have been lost because of industrial food system. I love the term true cost accounting because it does what it says on the tin. You know, it's the truth about cost. And I think that if this meeting could be the beginning of a process which we will not control, but hopefully we can influence, which can go far and wide, we, we have actually made history. So here we are. Um, I was listening to the news this morning and um, the British government had just announced that they're going to scrap uh, renewable energy subsidies after 2015 with the exception of offsh offshore wind. And if that is an isn't an indication of the challenge that we face in enabling this process to happen, I don't know what is. Um, so it's going to be evolution, not revolution. Um, but with a group, the group that are represented today here, which I would say constitutes uh, the most significant gathering ever of individuals and institutions with an interest in this field, if this is the start of a process which goes forward over years and is truly international in scale and scope, um, I think we will make progress because we have to, because the, the current food system Really, an, if an auditor was to look at it, he, he, an auditor would say it's fraudulent. It's not. It's not. It's not the truth. So we have to somehow unravel this, and I hope that during the next two days, in particular, we can make a very good start in doing that. Um, I mentioned the global foundations community and the one of the outcomes of the High Grove meeting being the establishment of a formal establishment of this body. So now I'm going to hand the word to. Ruth Richardson, uh, who was appointed just recently as the Foundation's uh, Collaborative Coordinator, and she's going to say a word about the progress that has been made. So uh, welcome, Ruth. Hello, everybody. Before I start, just that was a fantastic video. So thank you to whoever put that together. That was really great. Um, so as uh, Patrick mentioned, I'm Ruth and I'm the coordinator of what's called the Global Alliance for the Future of Food. Some of you will know the Global Alliance, many of you will not. It's a relatively new initiative on the landscape. Um, and I've been asked to provide a brief introduction to the Alliance and what I'd like to focus on is basically who we are, what we do, some um, early activities and what we hope to get out of Sustainable Food Trust's workshop over the next three days. So in terms of who we are, the Global Alliance for the Future of Food is a new alliance of foundations. Um, international foundations that each have their own programs on sustainable food and agriculture. They share a desire to shift the food system towards greater sustainability, equity, and security. And they share a commitment to collective action. The ambition is to combine energies behind innovative game-changing strategies. It represents more than 30 foundations from 10 countries 
from relatively small foundations like the Tudor Trust here in England to relatively large foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in Seattle, Washington, and everything in between. I won't name all 30, and you've heard some of the names of the foundations in, in Patrick's thanks, um, but some in the room include the Heller Foundation, California Endowment, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, the Agropolis Foundation, Heinrich Boll Stiftung, Christensen Fund, McKnight Foundation, Grace Communications Foundation, Owsley Brown Foundation, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, Willem and Velex Fonden, JMG Foundation, Metcalf Foundation, and others. These foundations have incredibly diverse interests and expertise spanning health, agriculture, food, community well-being, cultural diversity, and others. But despite these diverse interests, and, and perhaps because of them, um, at the core of the Global Alliance, it's a shared belief in the urgency of advancing food system reform, and importantly, in the power of working together and with others to do so. <coughs> Patrick's mentioned a little bit about the history of it, and I just want to sort of emphasize that um, the genesis of this alliance was really in the meeting hosted by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales at Highgrove in June 2012. And I don't think I would be overstating it to say that without his leadership and the inspiration behind his speech, The Future of Food, the alliance would not have been, um, would have not have taken shape in the way it has. I'll quickly give you a flavor of, of some of our um, activities to date. I know that um, the externalities and true cost accounting, I believe Ken will be talking a little bit more about that. But just um, from a high level, alongside building the foundation for the alliance, we've been heavily focused on trying to initiate action in four specific areas. Patrick also mentioned that at Highgrove, nine different themes surfaced. We um, went out to the membership of the Alliance to see which four were sort of most prominent and in need of action right away. And I'll just go over those four really quickly right now to give you a sense of what we're working on. The first working group is called Advancing Wellbeing, and it aims to expand our understanding of well-being and move from a relatively narrow set of indicators to a much more holistic and um, integrated set of criteria such as health, happiness, social and cultural well-being. We recognize that health and nutrition are central to well-being, but are not the whole picture. We really need to incorporate other things as food is so connected to identity, self-worth, ceremony, self-determination, family, and community. The second working group is called Agroecological Transitions, and it aims to make a more powerful case for the long-term multi-dimensional performance of agricultural and food systems based on ecological pr um, principles, looking at things such as reduction of fossil fuel use, development of local markets, the role of farmer-to-farmer -farmer exchanges, and so on. The third working group is called Scaling for Sustainability, which is looking at ways to appropriately scale change in the food system. We've had really fascinating conversations about the scale at which we can um, see the most powerful leverage points, and um, we've looked particularly at cities and municipal leadership. Finally, the externalities and true cost accounting, I don't really need to say a whole lot about that in this crowd, um, and it probably needs little explanation. We'll be talking about it over the next couple of days, but suffice it to say that that working group is looking at the true cost of producing food and applying true cost accounting to the externalities, both negative and positive, currently associated with agriculture and food systems. It's really important to point out that we recognize, as one of our members said, that we're coming to a table that is already crowded and doing very, very good work. But as an alliance of foundations, we believe that we have something unique to add to existing efforts, many of them led and driven by the people in this room. We feel that what we can do to add all to, to the stellar work that is already on, underway is to listen and learn from those on the ground, to build the effectiveness of individual philanthropic efforts as well as our collective ambitions, to help influence landscape level shifts through mobilizing networks of diverse stakeholders, to help ignite public engagement to create the space for political will, to inform the debate through research and effective practices, and to thoughtfully steward charitable investment and human resources for positive change. Ultimately, we aim to support the generation of new and different solutions at the global level that take us beyond our usual individual strategies. In other words, if we work together, we work better and smarter. Speaking of new and different solutions, this brings me to what we hope to get out of uh, Sustainable Food Trust Workshop over the next couple of days. I was at an event in Toronto where I'm based in November called Breakthrough Capital that was um, put on by Volens, which some of you may know. Volens is a consultancy here in London that works on market-based solutions. Volens came to Toronto to put on a workshop looking at the idea of breakthrough capitalism in the food system. It brought together local leaders from IKEA, The Natural Step, Sustainable Food Lab, Weston Foods, the Royal Bank of Canada, Aramark, Unilever, and many Canadian NGOs, small businesses, and so on. The question that was posed to us over this workshop was what will it take to make more progress faster? 
To explore this, we did a full day of scenario planning in order to identify a picture of the worst case scenario, business as usual, and what Volans calls breakthrough. The interesting thing for me was that almost unanimously, everyone agreed that the worst case scenario was basically the same as business as usual. That worst case was really just an exaggerated form of business as usual. And this was from food activists to grocery chain executives alike. So the implication being that the only solution is really breakthrough. There seems to be a visceral feeling that what we're doing isn't working. There seems to be a deep sense across the board of the urgency and the need for change. Not incremental change, but innovative, inspired, risky change that places us on a different trajectory in how we feed the world and protect the planet together in equal measure. We're really pleased to be invited to Sustainable um, Foundation Trust Workshop and have been happy to help um, you know, insert ideas into the agenda and to work with Patrick and his team on this. We're thrilled to be in a room with such deeply informed and intelligent people and we look forward to being part of the conversation about how we set a new direction and become a strong voice that gets sustainable food and agriculture on the political, economic and social agenda, connecting beyond our organizational borders in the name of collaboration and the future of food. Thank you. Okay, so with that background, a uh, couple of words on our objectives and then some logistics as to what's going to happen next. Um, clearly, our objectives are to make visible, you know, categorize, try to understand what we already know um, about how we can quantify and price all of these different externalities, um, to know each other doing this different work. So that's kind of <coughs> clear objective of the workshops we're about to have, and we'll, we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, Second, of course, objective of this meeting is, um, you know, to begin to discuss policy and, 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 and economic financial mechanisms whereby the prices um, that actually paid more accurate, more start to more accurately refre reflect the actual full and true costs of, uh, of, of production and distribution of food. And then thirdly, and of course this is the, the critical hidden ingredient, is to start strategizing together about how on earth we achieve this transformation. Because what we're in, of course, we're in, um, we're in what you might call a resilience trap. We have a food system that's incredibly resilient. Whatever we do, um, almost everybody knows it's wrong. And uh, the, there's a hundred obvious solutions. Every one we try, we find it's impossible to break, to break out of. Um, what are some of the reasons for that? Some of the reasons for that is that it's become so distorted that there's an almost infinite amount of money ready to resist any way to, to straighten it out because that's the size of the distortion. And I think that's some of the thinking that's going on um, in uh, you know, those of us here as we think about the only way we can release, um, release us from this trap, release us back into kind of creative solution making, sorry, control my hands, in, um, will be to, if we can start to quantify those costs, enable the public and policymakers to see those costs, and then that will give us the chance to, to break through. So lots of strategizing. Let's have lots of strategizing at this meeting, even as at the same time, you know, we're doing the basic scientific information exchange. All right. Heart of today, of course, are the workshops that we're about to have. Um, take out your programs if you haven't already. This microphone has a limited chance of survival. <laughs> <coughs> uh, you'll see there's three streams. Um, the first of them, uh, uh, pollution, emissions, and resource depletion. The second one being integrating biodiversity and food production. And the third one, uh, food systems and public health. As you can see, we've got two sessions back to back. And in each case, we're running through some of the main obvious areas of uh, negative externalities. I hope there's at least one paper on positive externalities, but I don't know where it is. But um, there is, great, okay. Um, we've got these two sessions back to back. Something I want to point out for the organizers of the first of these, the pollution emissions and resource depletion. They are trying to organize their sessions in as a kind of a whole, right, Todd? So they're saying, please, if you come to our sessions, come to both. I don't know if they're going to actually uh, have a guard at the door um, with a name list, but they're saying please come to both. But otherwise, I think you can mix and match. I'm sure we all want to go to all six of these. Um, that'll be how it is. 